Thank you, Jamie, for the nice introduction. Um, as you just said, my name is Ryan Pancaw. I am a horticulture educator here in Champaign County. So I serve Champaign, Ford, Vermilion, and Iroquois counties in central Illinois. And I have a background as a forester and an arborist. So I bring to you kind of both perspectives of an arborist that cares for that single tree in your yard that does everything to save and take care of and pamper that one tree uh, to a forest who looks at things as an ecosystem and manages on the ecosystem level uh, a community of plants and animals uh, for the benefit of that forest ecosystem. So um, here's kind of an outline of our presentation for today. Um, and, you know, I, I bring to you, uh, this has been a topic of interest for me in researching and understanding and learning, learning more about, uh, just because in the past in coursework in my uh, career, I've heard a lot about these historic pest outbreaks that, you know, have wiped out entire species across our continent. And now, uh, in this modern day and age, we've seen emerald ash borer kind of emerge as that you know, uh, kind of our modern day version of one of these pests. And it's just been interesting to me to kind of study the past, look at the present and, and draw some parallels and some conclusions about how these pests have spread, how they got here, what can we learn from this uh, to protect ourselves in the future? So here's kind of the outline of what we'll cover today. Um, you know, I, I, I'll go through some of these historic pest outbreaks all the way up to Emerald Ash Borer. And then I'd like to look at, uh, just a few of these newer outbreaks that have kind of caught my attention in the last year or so. Uh, so let's start with a, a discussion of American chestnut. So um, in 1900, this is one of the most dominant species of the Eastern forest uh, with about 4 billion chestnuts um, east of the Mississippi in the US. So that's a huge uh, amount of trees, uh, one in four in, in the natural range of chestnut was a chestnut tree. So that's a lot of abundance. Uh, it was important ecologically just due to the fact that there were so many chestnuts, they were the biggest part of this eco, big part of the ecosystem, but also it was important, uh, important commercially or culturally. We as humans use this plant for a ton of different uses. Um, so here's some details about the chestnut. It's, it's a very a tall tree at maturity. It's what I would classify as a large shade tree. Uh, with a pretty fast growth rate. So faster growth rate than I would attribute to an oak or one of the other you know, major tall uh, shade trees that we look at these days. Um, it has this oblong you know, toothed leaf, uh, a nice yellow, yellow to white flower display in June of each year. So it had a wonderful flowering display. You couldn't miss a chestnut in flower because that whole canopy was filled with these uh, wonderful flowers in, in about June. So kind of late in the year. Um, and of course, its, it's fruit is un, unmistakable with its spiny husk and the, the nut that's in, held inside that. Uh, a lot of us have seen these and would recognize these. So that's kind of a description of the chestnut as a single tree. Here's the chestnut's range. So you can see it, it took a vast chunk of the eastern forest and, and really dominated that area as one of the dominant trees in the overstory. So uh, chestnut was culturally important, uh, but it was also a keystone species throughout its range, meaning uh, this is one of those plants that, or one of the species that an ecosystem largely depended on. So if it would, if it's removed, it's gonna drastically impact that ecosystem. A lot of other things rely on it. So uh, that's from the standpoint of wildlife. We as humans used it for all these things you see here, everything from posts and shingles to flooring and furniture, um, it was just an excellent uh, timber product, an excellent wood characteristic out of this plant. Um, and as you can see, wildlife used it. Um, we as humans actually used it as food as well. So uh, the chestnut uh, nut itself was sought after by humans. And uh, there's a lot of great traditions and stories surrounding the harvest of chestnuts every year. Um, and there's a ton of other uses. We could, the list goes on and on. So it was a very useful tree to both humans and wildlife. Well, at one point, chestnut blight showed up on our, con on our continent, uh, and it was caused by this um, fungus from Asia that we brought here as humans um, that would actually infect uh, chestnuts and cause these stem girdling cankers. Like you see a canker starting to form on this uh, stem right here. Um, and so when those cankers would start to form, they would actually cut off the conductive tissue in the tree and, and fairly rapidly kill uh, chestnuts. Uh, you can see uh, the list of kind of the susceptible trees uh, right here. And so, you know, even some of our oaks, our native oaks are susceptible to this pathogen, but maybe in a different way than chestnuts. So we'll talk about that in a few slides too as well. 
So where was chestnut first chestnut blight first detected? Um, in 1904 in the Bronx, Bronx Zoo, it was the first detection of this uh, pathogen. It was brought in on infected plant material from Asia, from another continent. And so um, our native our native chestnuts had no built-in resistance to this. They had no co-evolutionary history with this um, pathogen in, in their natural range. So when we introduced this, it was a game changer. Um, it spread rapidly due to the multiple forms of spread that this uh, pathogen can use. So either through ascospores, through from, from windblown spread, it could, it could spread from conidia, rain could splash it and spread it from tree to tree on a smaller scale. Uh, for plants, but birds and insects could carry that infection if they were infected through the canidia. So there was a lot of ways that this could rapidly and quickly spread, uh, causing the severity of this um, outbreak to, to happen. Um, also, another important point, if you, as you saw on the last slide, uh, some of our oaks are susceptible to this pathogen. They don't die from it, but they're able to be this continual infection source out there in the environment. So even after, you know, a lot of the chestnuts die in a stand, this pathogen is still present in other trees. So if a chestnut sprouts from a nut, if a chestnut sprouts from a stump, um, it's able to be reinfected very readily from this pathogen. Uh, this is a really interesting map to me. It kind of shows the spread of this of chestnut blight starting in 1909 up in the upper right there at the Bronx Zoo and just all these waves of spread, uh, you know, rapidly progressed through the chestnuts range until by about 1950 or so, the chestnut was functionally extinct from its ecosystem. And by functionally extinct, we don't mean that the plant was totally gone and extinct necessarily, but it was not functioning in that capacity as a keystone species in the ecosystem as, as it had for many millennia before. So, um, so when we look at um, blight susceptibility, there's actually you know, different levels of blight susceptibility among the, the genus the chestnut belongs to. So our American chestnut, unfortunately, is highly susceptible. Um, if we look at the European chestnut, it's a little bit less susceptible. And um, it benefited from um, a concept of hypovirulence, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this discussion of chestnuts. But that's where a virus actually infects the fungal pathogen and uh, reduces its impact to the chestnut tree. So it's, it's kind of interesting. It's a couple of different pathogens here working together to actually benefit our chestnut tree, where if we look at the Chinese chestnut, it is resistant to the blight. And that's simply because it had a co-evolutionary history on the same continent with this pathogen, those, that plant and this path and pathogen evolved together. So they're able to, um, you know, somewhat live in harmony where, um, you know, when, when you bring it to a different continent like ours, that's when it becomes a true pathogen. So what does American chestnut look like today? Well, um, as I said, it's functionally extinct from its ecosystem, but that doesn't mean it's absolutely extinct on the planet. Uh, the actual root systems of mature chestnuts do have blight resistance. So they're able to live under the ground and function and send up uh, some stump sprouts. On one of my slides earlier, I, it, it mentioned that uh, this plant readily stump sprouts. So that means if you cut a chestnut tree down, it readily will sprout from the stump and grow um, another tree from that. A lot of our other, a lot of other native trees have that ability too. So, um, so uh, it does exist today as stump sprouts produced from these viable root systems that can stay alive in forests. But unfortunately, as soon as those stump sprouts get very large, they get infected and succumb. Uh, we have some isolated western trees that still do exist that are far away from the native range of this uh, of the chestnut and are just kind of in their own little isolated area that you, you often hear stories of these of a, you know, of a historic chestnut that still exists in a, in a small town somewhere, um, usually west of the Mississippi and again far from the native range. Um, so we also have an active chestnut breeding program uh, in this country, and there's a lot of folks looking at this. So uh, we actually have some blight resistant trees that have been developed by a number of different methods. Uh, the first method that was attempted to make a blight resistant chestnut was through crossbreeding. So directly crossing our American chestnut with Asian, Asian chestnut species that again have some of that evolutionary history built into the, uh, their genetics, so they have some resistance. So uh, what we found is we could present, we could create or breed for a res blight resistant 
uh, chestnut species when we cross these two. However, um, in a forested setting, they weren't competitive. So they could be great as an urban tree for someone like an arborist that wanted to plant it somewhere. But when we try as a forester, if you try to put these out into the landscape and reestablish chestnut and that all that ecosystem function it provided, uh, they just weren't able to, to do it. So uh, in about the around the 80s to now, a lot of folks have looked at looked at this concept of back crossing. And that's where we take an American chestnut and Chinese chestnut cross, and then we back cross that with just American chestnut. So uh, what we're hoping, what folks hope to do in this process is to kind of dilute the American, the Chinese genes with more of the American genes, but just enough American genes that we don't lose the blight resistance, where we hold on to that, but we still capture enough of those American genes that hopefully this plant could, you know, function in an ecosystem like we would normally see. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier, this concept of hypovirulence, um, and this is where a virus actually infects the fungus that is the pathogen in the, in the chestnut. So, um, you know, it naturally occurred in European chestnut, which is where we first observed this on Earth. Um, and it actually has allowed the European chestnut to slowly recover from the blight because it's, as it's spread and been passed from chestnut to chestnut, again, as a second, another pathogen has came in here and, and acted upon the first pathogen. So really, really fascinating. Um, there's been a little bit of success in Lower Peninsula, Michigan, uh, observing some naturally occurring hypovirulence here in, in the States, but uh, not enough that it just doesn't really happen on our continent well enough to really control for that. But uh, here's a picture of the Arner tree from up in Canada, which is famous for this on, on our continent, having some of this hypovirulence, uh, where it actually has succumbed like multiple bouts with a uh, chestnut blight uh, and by, because the, again, the blight pathogen has been weakened by this virus. Uh, but it's not, and on, our, on our continent, this has not been proven successful at the ecological level. So we've not, we've not achieved what the um, European chestnut has achieved in recovery um, where this, you know, it, it's just not as effective here. We can use this actually as a treatment from the standpoint of an arborist to treat an individual canker on an individual tree and it's, it's effective that way, but it just isn't able to spread throughout an ecosystem on North America and really provide complete control like that. We as humans have to actually add that to the tree to get that, um, res that uh, resistance to the, to the, fun to the fungus. Uh, so something that rec very recently has come about in trying to address this issue of resistance is biotechnology or genetic modification. So scientists have taken the, o, the OXO gene from wheat plants and inserted that into chestnut uh, genetics, which has created blight resistant trees. So um, essentially what happens with chestnut blight is the fungus produces um, oxalic acid. You know, So that's, that's a common uh, part of many plant pathogens and it's used to attack the host plant, to break down tissue, to get into the plant where this OXO gene uh, codes for oxalate oxidase, which actually is um, an enzyme that breaks down that oxalic acid in the plant. So when we add this gene from wheat and many other um, plants that naturally have this gene to the chestnut genome, we get a complete and utter blight resistance. So it's really a fascinating point um, aspect of, of genetic modification for a, a forest plant. We don't really see a lot of that in forestry and other applications, the use of genetically modified organisms. We see that um, across the board in other areas of agriculture, but not so much in forestry. So uh, currently this is awaiting approval in the US from the EPA and the FDA. Um, there was a public comment period that I think just ended back in October. So that's a period where this is under review. Um, whether this plant could be released for um, restoration purposes is kind of the point. Uh, folks would like to restore chestnut across its, across its range with uh, this new biotechnology that's, that's resistant to the blight. So it, it'll be interesting to see how this progresses. This is the only path that I can see that we have for um, potentially having um, a blight resistant chestnut in Eastern forests. So, um, it will be interesting to see what develops with this over the coming years. So uh, from the arborist perspective, I always go back to this of 
you know, how we've talked about this plant as a forested species. We've talked about it as on the ecological level. You know, how does it add up as a shade tree? And I, I can't say that I've been fortunate enough to have a ton of experience with chestnuts over my career as an arborist. I, there's one that I've been able to treat and, you know, climb and prune and deal with over the years. And unfortunately, it has eventually succumbed uh, to chestnut blight in this day and age. But, um, you know, if we look at just the characteristics of the plant, it has a lot of things that we look for in a nice shade tree. It's tall and it's fast growing. So that's one of the things that I think are the best. Uh, has a nice flowering display and it's actually a pretty late flower display. You know, I noted earlier it was in June. So that's um, a little bit later than a lot of our other native trees. So that's kind of unique. Um, and it actually produces a food. So that's, that's kind of the good side. The only thing on the bad side I can see is maybe some messiness. You know, is it the next sweet gum with all these husks that can litter the ground and hurt your foot if you step on them? Or uh, would it be one of those issues for us? Um, I don't know. So it'd be interesting to see if we can really stabilize this tree across its range and maybe someday it can be a, a, a shade tree in a lot of our yards again. So now let's look at another native species to our continent, the American elm, which has sadly succumbed to yet another one of these uh, continent uh, overtaking pathogens. So uh, American elm is, um, you know, of course, native to really even, even further uh, west of the Mississippi. So everything east of the Mississippi, it's native to, and all the way out to about the foot of the Rockies is its native range. Um, in 19th century America, this is one of our preferred shade trees that made these beautiful, you know, uh, cathedral-like pictures you can see from, you know, earlier in this, in the, in the 19th century of, uh, you know, a lot of streets lined with this tree. Um, this picture that you see here is from the entrance to Morton Arboretum, where they have a carefully cared for, um, carefully cared for, uh, you know, specimen of American elm that every time I visit that place, I love to just look at it and admire this tree because you don't get to see these very often. Um, on the basic description, it's um, an alternate leafed arrangement with tooth leaves. And the way I can always tell an, an elm is their leaf has an asymmetrical base. So where the base of that uh, leaf meets the petiole, it's asymmetrical. It's not the same on both sides. So that's how you can almost always tell an elm. Um, and so here's a map of the um, actual native range of the elm. You can see it is, it is a wide, wide range. And it across its range, it inhabits uh, quite a range of, of habitats as well, uh, where it's, you know, typically kind of confined to some of the bottomland, uh, more music sites, uh, but did very, very well as an urban tree when we put it into some of the uh, harsh urban conditions that it could be planted in as well. So uh, Dutch elm disease was, is the next kind of pathogen we'll cover today, and it was caused by a couple of different fungal pathogens that we believe originated in Asia. Um, which are actually spread by elm bark beetles. So as those beetles uh, feed on an infected elm and travel to an uninfected elm, they spread this pathogen along with their, um, their life processes and what they do. So uh, it's pretty safe to say it, it results in pretty rapid death of an elm tree. If you all have ever seen an elm tree uh, just rapidly die from uh, Dutch elm disease, it can happen just over the course of like a summer. Uh, or one a single growing season or part of a growing season. You know, the picture in the upper right there shows one of those trees that's just, you know, over the course of a summer, just dying limb by limb. Uh, the bottom picture there are the elm bark beetle galleries. So you can see all the feeding that they would do in that tree. And you can kind of think about how that bark beetle getting in there would actually, uh, you know, kind of spread that pathogen and, and reinfect the um, cambium tissue of, of, of the plant. Uh, so here's another one of those maps I think really illustrates the point of, of how it's spread and how rapidly you can see all the different dates, the different states have reported the initial infection. Um, interestingly, this pathogen was first introduced in Cle to Cleveland, Ohio in 1930, uh, but it was eradicated. We detected it, we stopped it, um, and it was eradicated. Uh, but sadly, in 1933, it, the East Coast saw another round of infection. And that's kind of what launched the, um, the conquest of our continent, so to speak, uh, as this pathogen just kind of rapidly spread, you know, reaching California in the, by the 70s and the West Coast kind of by the 70s. Um, you know, it hit Illinois in the 50s, and that's when we probably saw the biggest impacts. If, if folks can remember that throughout the 50s and 60s, all the elm trees in Illinois were succumbing to this. Uh, so what are some of the susceptible species? Pretty much all of our native elms. It's a, a very similar to the chestnut blight pathogen in that, you know, all of our native elms are susceptible. Uh, European elms, for the most part, are also susceptible, whereas 
the Asian elm species are resistant. And that's what makes us think this pathogen did, came from Asia. Um, and, and again, explains kind of why our, all the elm trees on our continent are much more susceptible. So uh, what do elm trees look like today? Well, elms still exist in forests. They're still able to grow and uh, be a part of the understory and even produce some seed at times. But eventually, uh, they do succumb to Dutch elm disease once they're infected, once the beetles find them. Uh, we do have uh, some rare, you know, some mature species, either out in woodland settings. I've seen mature elms that have escaped the uh, Dutch elm disease one way or another. And I've even seen them in urban settings where there are cases where there's some resistant elms out there that have somehow just not been infected by, by Dutch elm disease or there's effective treatments. We can actually, we actually have effective uh, pesticides that we can apply that you know, keep the beetles away and limit the infection uh, of, of elm trees if you really wanted to protect an elm tree. So, but we have had quite a bit of, just like chestnut, we've had quite a bit of you know, breeding to try and find some resistance, to try and create an elm that could be restored across its, across its natural range and really could compete in a forest environment. Like I said a minute ago, they, they exist in forests, but they, they don't have that same function that they did when they could be a mature part of the canopy or the overstory of the forest. So uh, we've had some hybrid elms produced over the years and we've got pretty good resistance out of those. They're um, you know, tough urban trees, they survive the urban en environment, they grow well, they do great, uh, but they're not a, a replacement from the ornamental standpoint. So they're usually smaller at maturity, they have a little bit different of a habit. And I kind of described that earlier, the elm's habit of this nice, you know, vase-shaped plant. And we like that because um, it, it allows it to be tall and the canopy is up above a lot of things. So it's a great street tree because it has that that nice vase shape that where it can be up and out of the way. It's not, it doesn't have the lower hanging down branches, especially if you can kind of prune those off. So um, again, Asian, the Asian hybrids had good resistance, but they just, they didn't quite fit the bill. Um, so we also have had some developments of uh, actual Dutch elm resist, resistant cultivars. So the different between, difference between a hybrid where we combine two different species. So in a hybrid, in the case of the hybrids in the last slide, we've taken Asian elms and cross those with American elms to get this hybrid. Um, a cultivar is simply just an American elm, so an Ulmus americana plant that actually has some natural resistance in that. So uh, we can breed for that and select for the individual elm that has a little bit of resistance. And we have produced some uh, successful examples of that. Uh, they're listed here um, over the years. So they're, they, they exist as well and they're, they're great um, as, a, as an urban tree, as a resistant variety, you could plant in an urban setting, but again, they just can't make that jump to a forested setting where we could restore them on an ecosystem level. So we really still haven't, still haven't achieved that in elm trees. So to look at American elm as a shade tree, I do have a little bit more experience with this plant. I've dealt with a number of elms over the years because there are those rare uh, survivors around. Um, it's good because it has fast growth. It's a fast growing tree. That's what a lot of us want is a, a shade tree that can quickly establish. Um, and again, we've kind of talked about its habit. It has that nice vase shaped habit that you can see here of a, a tree that's kind of has a V shaped canopy that's kind of, uh, you know, it, again, in that V shape facing upwards. Um, and it's very adaptable to the urban environment. As far as trees go, um, Elms are super adaptable to all those things that we throw at it in the urban environment, whether it's soil compaction, whether it's um, road salts or other impacts. Uh, maybe one of the problems with an elm is its messiness. Uh, they tend to drop a lot of dead limbs. It seems like every time the wind blows, an elm tree drops some dead limbs. And also along with that V-shaped arching habit, that creates a lot of narrow branch unions on elm trees. So um, they suffer from, a, in, in narrow branch unions, we know from research and from observation that they are less uh, structurally sound than a nice wide open kind of U-shaped branch union that would have more structural stability. So uh, those are some of the drawbacks. Uh, so now let's move to kind of our modern day version of a chestnut blight or a Dutch elm disease, which is the emerald ash borer. So as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of, it's been fascinating for me to actually observe. I mean, it's very sad and I'm, um, it's very sad to see the spread of this pathogen, but uh, this insect has just, it's went from, you know, initial infection in Detroit in 2002, 
uh, to you know the range that you see now on this map from I guess that's from February of 2020. Uh, I did look at the November map last night, realizing that I had the February map in here, and it really hasn't changed a heck of a lot. Uh, there's a little bit of change in Iowa and, and Missouri there on that actual, the, the western edge of it, but not too much uh, to date. Um, but we've seen this uh, pathogen rapidly spread, and it's just been interesting to observe the public's reaction, the, you know, the message that folks have sent out about it. Uh, you know, don't spread firewood, I think, is the big message we should associate with emerald ash borer. But um, it really has impacted a lot of states. That's, it's up to 35 U.S. states and growing. Um, and really not, not seeing much of a, a, a stop in, um, uh, in, in sight for this pathogen. So uh, how does it kill trees? Well, it's a little bit different than the past two pathogens we talked about. So with both chestnut blight and Dutch elm disease, we saw two different fungal pathogens. In the case of chestnut blight, it was really those stem girdling cankers that caused the mortality of the tree. Where, whereas in Dutch elm disease, we saw death uh, of, of elm trees because the trees own a reaction to that pathogen in its conductive tissue uh, caused a reaction that actually clogged the uh, conductive tissue of the tree and caused death that way. In this case, it's, it's a little bit similar to Dutch elm disease that uh, the larvae actually feed on that conductive tissue, which is just right inside the dark, inside the bark. So the cambium layer is what we refer to that as in, uh, in trees. And that's uh, if you want to look at it this way, maybe the veins and arteries of the tree, they're just right inside the bark there. They're nutrient rich. These larvae just love them when they get in there and can feed on them. So, um, so a little different in that it's, it's not a, 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 a pathogen that's spreading through the tree as, those, as a, fun, a fungus would, but um, it's this insect larva that is spread, spread through the tree and um, in, in killing that cambium area. So one thing to note is that it does kill st both stressed and healthy ash trees. And so that's of note because a lot of times pathogens tend to uh, focus on the more stressed trees and allow healthy trees to persist where with emerald ash borer, it doesn't matter. They tend to you know, take a healthy or non-healthy tree. So how can you identify emerald ash borer? Well, I think the main way that we identify it um, is through the rapid decline in tree health. So when you have an ash tree that has a lot of dead limbs, pretty safe to say that um, it's infected with an emerald ash borer here in Illinois. So if you can get up close and find them, uh, there's D-shaped exit holes, and you can see a picture of that in the bottom right here, where uh, unlike a lot of our native uh, wood boring insects, um, emerald ash borers leave this kind of characteristic, just D-shaped exit hole. Most of our natives would leave a round um, exit hole. Um, another sign is woodpecker damage. And you see um, at the left there, uh, a, a woodpecker damaged bark that has what we refer to as blonding, where the woodpecker, there's been a lot of woodpecker activity there and they've knocked off some pieces and you can see some lower bark and it creates that lighter color. So that's pretty distinctive if you enter a woodland that has a lot of ash and a lot of emerald ash borer infection. You can see this on a lot of those trees right away. Uh, dead trees usually stick out also, but um, we do see like a lot of woodpecker activity. They absolutely love these larvae and they're, they're out there eating them. And actually that's one of our main natural controls is um, just woodpecker um, predation of the, of the larva. So how has this pathogen spread? Uh, well, there's been different numbers over the years published in research of the actual natural rate of dispersion. So they, these guys can fly, so they can naturally disperse um, and but uh, the biggest factor in all of this is that we as humans, either through firewood, uh, distributing firewood, or on nursery stock, we have drastically sped up, sped up this spread. So if you've paid attention to the news in other places, you've probably seen some of these public service messages, don't spread firewood. That's kind of been the campaign with that emerald ash borer to, to get the message out to folks because um, it, the, the point of it, of this slide, is that it really can't spread that far on its own. Um, it's we as humans that have really sped it up. So what's that rate of spread that we've seen in Illinois? Um, well, uh, June in 2006 was the first infection that we saw in Northern Illinois. And again, remember it was introduced into Detroit in about 2002. So it took it about four years to make it all the way across Michigan and hit Illinois. And then you can see some of the other dates where it's kind of you know slowly spread down the state from the Northern area. Um, we've had quarantines in, in place to try and uh, you know, kind of limit that spread. And that was on the county level initially, where um, in 2015, we had about 10 new counties identified that brought our total up to about 60. 
and our state lifted the the quarantine between counties so that means it's far it's widespread enough across the state that uh, additional quarantine efforts within Illinois are not going to help. Uh, we still do have a federal uh, quarantine in place. So that says that you cannot move firewood across the state border from Illinois. So please uh, consider that, respect that. Um, that's going to stop some of our neighbors from getting infection quite as quick. Um, and here's just kind of uh, county by county. You can see the, the years these were confirmed. Um, this is data from 2016 uh, shared by the Illinois Department of Agriculture. I'm Appreciate them they, they sharing this map. Um, probably what we've seen since 2016 is just a little more infection in the southern part of the state. And not, as I was reviewing the kind of the current maps, I left in this old slide from 2016 just because in 2020 we don't have a whole lot of difference. And I do have to wonder if some of that is underreporting in the southern part of the state. I think it's probably a little more present than what we see here. But if you look at a current day 2020 map, it's about the same. There's maybe a few more counties in the very southern tip of the state that were added, but um, kind of serves to illustrate the point here of, of how it's kind of you know, spread from north to south across our state. Uh, so what's the future for ash trees in Illinois and, and on our continent? Well, uh, it hasn't happened yet uh, across its range, but ash will become functionally extinct throughout its range. And, and we just know that from what's happened in Michigan, from what's happened east of here, uh, how we've seen this spread and just the, the you know, how quickly ash have succumbed to, to death from this pathogen. Uh, we're still looking for some natural resistance and that's a question to be answered yet. Um, are there some ash species, some individuals of, of ash species out there that will show some resistance? Will we have that, you know, random ash tree that's still alive somewhere because uh, for some reason insects weren't attracted to it? Uh, there's also some question of whether or not blue ash has some resistance. Uh, that's been reported in some areas that blue ash has some resistance. I think what folks have seen is uh, in the initial wave of infection, blue ash was maybe a second choice for emerald ash borer. So we thought at one point there was going to be some, some promise there, where I think as all the white ash, green ash, other ash species kind of fall out of the stand, blue ash is kind of the last one of the last things that um, emerald ash borer infects. So. Um, I don't know, that's still another question yet to be answered. What, what was that resistance in blue ash and is there a way that we can use it as humans to, to benefit um, ash species as a whole? Finally, um, will bi biological control work with emerald ash borer? So there is actually some biological control that's been researched and studied and has now been actually released since 2007 into 25 different states. So. In this case, uh, what I'm talking about with biological control is another insect that is to actually a, a predator or um, kills emerald ash borer at the larval stage is typically how they impact it. So there's four of these wasps from other continents that we've actually introduced here in the US to combat emerald ash borer. So uh, here's just kind of a map of emerald ash, of some of these uh, biological control agents or wasps that have been released in the US and where they were released in 2018 and 2019 um, is represented by the yellow uh, counties. But all those black dots are spots where we've recovered additional individuals of the species, meaning that they've been able to survive in the wild. We've introduced them, they've survived, we've recaptured them the next year. So that's an important fact here that we're, we've brought, again, we've brought another um, insect from another continent here to help control this and there's no guarantee that it'll be able to survive and exist in our ecosystem here. So here's kind of both like the both the 2020 emerald ash borer map and that uh, 2019 biocontrol map kind of laid next to each other so you can see where some of those introductions have happened. Um, and so that's something that folks are clo closely following um, whether or not that biological control will work and I will um, return to that in a second. Uh, but anyway, so what kind of resistance do we see in our native ash trees? Um, some of the younger native ash trees actually do show some resistance. Um, so we do see younger ash trees in stands right now, uh, regardless of whether or not emerald ash borer is here. Um, we have, so we've got these, uh, we have some native parasitoid wasps, wasps that do provide some emerald ash borer control. So not the the foreign wasps that we've introduced, uh, but some of our natives actually do provide some control for emerald ash borer. We've actually seen woodpeckers providing some decent control of the larva. And while they've not stopped the spread, there's several studies that can attribute 
you know, woodpecker feeding activity and increased numbers of woodpeckers around this leading front of the emerald ash borer infection wave, uh, you know, limiting that spread or slowing that spread a bit. So if we can stop the spread of firewood, we can let some of these natural processes take case, uh, take, take some, uh, do some of it for us. So uh, finally, we have some of these, uh, again, these introduced wasps from Asia. So here you can see, uh, you know, the four different species that have been tried on this continent, uh, where, you know, some of them are egg parasitoids, meaning they parasitize the egg, killing the egg before it hatches. Some are, uh, par are parasites to the larval stage of emerald ash borer. So you can see where, um, you know, a few of these are at the larval stage, and it's, I guess it's just one that's from the egg stage. Uh, three of them are from China and one is from Russia. So they're all from Asia, but from different places. And we've got the top three here that have been kind of in play or um, introduced here in the US since about 2007. So we have going on about 10 years of data now from some of these um, biological control methods. So there are some good uh, published research out there if you check it out, that, that look at how effective this control has been. And there, and you know, I've kind of quoted some of that research here with some of these numbers, but you know, again, some of these studies are now you know, getting to be over 10 years old and able to really show us some data. And uh, there's actually a lot of promise in the biological control of emerald ash borer. So that'll be an interesting thing to follow and see um, in the coming years, how these um, biological control agents can maybe help at least slow the spread or uh, almost stop it in places. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that, this was probably the best document I found that has just a lot of the history behind how they found the, these species and how, um, how it's worked in Michigan. And they've showed some really great uh, numbers in Michigan. You know, and this, again, this is after the, kind of that initial wave of ash borer came through, they introduced these and they're showing some really good um, control after the initial wave came through. And one of the things that these folks are really concerned with is the fact that um, once all of our native or the mature ash trees die, we don't have a seed source. So if there's a way that we can keep some of these younger trees healthy, and if these, um, you know, parasitoid wasps can do that, uh, that's going to be a great way to keep some ash seed in the seed bank and in the understory and just keep ash there until if there's ever some way that we could find a solution to this problem, we could introduce that. So um, anyway, if you're interested in more about that, um, check out that document I cited there, and, and there's some great um, info in there. Uh, so now let's turn to just a couple of the newer threats and look at how they compare and contrast to some of these historic threats. So uh, laurel blight is one that recently um, has kind of been in the news um, approaching our region of the country and so has drawn my attention and, and, and um, I've started to kind of research it and look at how it works. Uh, so it was first detected in 2003 in Georgia on red bay trees. So red bays are um, you know, 30 to 60 foot tall broadleafed evergreen trees that um, are not native to our area, but um, climatic zones south of us, they, they're not winter hardy enough to grow in our area, but that's kind of where it started. Uh, it's caused by a previously unknown fungal pathogen again, assumed to be from Asia. But it's spread by an invas an, another invasive species, the red bay ambrosia beetle. And you can see a picture of that little guy in the bottom corner here. And then on a penny for relative size, you can see how small that little beetle is, but um, it's kind of the perfect storm of, again, a fungal pathogen and an insect vector that takes it and spreads it to, to tree to tree as it feeds. So uh, those uh, ambrosia beetles are able to fly and they're able to move from tree to tree and infect similar to, you know, like we discussed with the emerald ash borer, but again, it's moving a logs, firewood, all these other things that ambrosia beetles can be in that is really, you know, sped up that spread. So what are the species that are affected? Well, uh, red bays and, and others in the laurel family that grow, you know, south of here in warmer climates. But in Illinois, our two susceptible species of note are sassafras and spicebush. And those are two, you know, wonderful native species. Sassafras is a large, you know, a, a, a tree uh, sized plant. So uh, probably you know, 60 to 70 feet tall at maturity. Um, it has some, some unique and interesting characteristics. Spice bush, shade tolerant understory shrub that um, is just, it's one of my favorites for planting in a shade garden in, um, in an urban setting, as well as um, it's one that for many years I've managed for in the understory of woodlands across Illinois. So it's a great uh, native shrub, both of which are susceptible to this pathogen. So 
Uh, where is Laurel, Laurel Wilt currently at? Well, you can see it's focused around, you know, kind of the Red Bay's range down there. Uh, really bad in Florida. And, you know, again, that initial infection, infection kind of happened in Georgia. But if you look up towards the northern edge of that map, it's starting to creep up into Kentucky. And uh, in discussing this issue with other foresters in southern Illinois and Kentucky, there's a belief that it's probably a little under uh, reported up in that area of the country, and we're probably going to see it entering Illinois at some point. So um, I think probably one of the big limiting factors of this uh, pathogen is temperature and cold hardiness. So hopefully, my hope is that um, in Illinois, where it's cold enough here that we're gonna we're going to not experience a, a, a terrible infection from this pathogen, but um, it's one to watch and certainly one to monitor if you have a sassafras in your woodland or your yard or a, or a spice bush to, to keep a, look, a lookout in the coming years. Um, so next, the next newer one on the horizon or in the grand scheme of things is sudden oak death. And uh, new to our part of the country, but not to California. It was in the 90s that it was introduced there on um, some imported plant material. And it really has just devastated some of the coastal oak ecosystems in California. And there's really, if you really read about this, it's a super scary pathogen and how quickly um, it, can, it can spread. And um, just the wide range of host species that it has, over 100 host species globally. Um, so in woody plants, Phytophthora remorum, the pathogen we're talking about here, um, causes two different diseases. So there's a difference in this case between P. remorum, the pathogen we're talking about, and then the diseases that it produces. So remorum blight is the first that it produces in other plants. And that's actually a foliar, foliar disease in many species. So it affects the leaves. It's often not lethal to the plant. Uh, it's simply a leaf infection that really makes the plant not look great. Uh, but a lot of plants can uh, overcome it. Whereas sudden oak death is the other disease that this same pathogen P. remorum creates um, that is a fatal disease of oaks. Um, you know, and, and similar to chestnut blight through um, trunk girdling uh, cankers is how it actually kills the, the oak trees. So um, really rapid death. Again, that's to me the scariest thing about this in just a few weeks to a few years. Um, and it's spread by spores from infected plants. So it's windblown. It, it can be spread by animals coming in contact with it. It's, it's in the environment. It's easily spread. Um, and one of the things to note with this is that with its large, wide range of host species, um, there's a lot of just infection source in the ecosystem. So there's a lot of plants that can live with this pathogen and not succumb to it. Maybe they just have remorum blight. Uh, but they're infecting the oaks that are right next to them, and they serve as this just reinfection source out there. Even after oaks perish, they're still there, still able to reinfect uh, the rest of the ecosystem. So here's kind of a little bit more of uh, the details of remorum blight versus sudden oak death. So again, remorum blight, just a foliar disease. And you can see on this uh, bay laurel here, you know, the dead tips that it causes, it kind of kills some leaves. Uh, whereas again, sudden oak death is this uh, stem girdling canker, and you can see kind of an oozing canker there, um, for a picture from California of what the, the actual cankers look like. So this is actually a pathogen that we here in Illinois have had a brush with back in May of 2019. Um, the pathogen that causes sudden oak death was found in Illinois. So that's an important part of these headlines. I had a lot of folks contact me uh, that saw the, the pre media um, kind of you know, uh, reporting that sudden oak death was in Illinois. And then if you Google sudden oak death and look at some scenes from California, it really looks like a, a, a grim uh, future for oaks in Illinois. Well, uh, we actually didn't have sudden oak death here. We, what we found, what was found in Illinois and several other states was uh, remorum blight. So the foliar infection that this plant, that this pathogen causes. So that was de detected on uh, nursery stock in Illinois and several other states. I think there's up to about 18 different states um, across the Midwest that had infected plants delivered. Um, in Illinois, it was on rhododendrons and lilacs, and um, at nurseries is where this was found. So that, that's kind of an important, there's some important points in this, and I think a lot of, it got a lot of media coverage, and I think um, the media was kind of unclear in exactly what was going on here. So the main points on this are just that we did not have oak 
uh, sudden oak death on the ground in Illinois, uh, we had remorum blight and we believe it to be up to this point confined to nurseries and, and places where plants were for sale. And it really speaks um, highly to our, um, our state and federal regulatory agencies that they were able to quickly and rapidly find um, infected plant materials and trace them to their source and eliminate, eliminate those materials before they were sold to the general public. So uh, there was a really rapid response there in May and June of 2019. And a lot of those plant materials were recalled from retail outlets and nurseries. And they were able to just exactly trace all this back to infected plant material from Oklahoma is one, one of the sources where it came from. So um, we believe it to be main, uh, believe it, we believe it to be contained at this point, but it's still something for us to be aware of and keep on your mind. And if if anybody you know, or if you have a newly planted rhododendron or lilac that starts to show symptoms like you see here from the plant clinic photo, um, it's absolutely vital that you um, report that and and make sure that folks uh, that that we get that reported to the Illinois Department of Agriculture and other folks that look, that are watching for this. Uh, but to date, we don't think it's escaped on the landscape. And that would be the worst thing is if some of these infected plants were planted out into the landscape and um, they, they're able to infect some other plants and we got an infection source of remoram blight in the ecosystem that could eventually translate into sudden oak death. So um, for the moment, we think we're safe, but this is one to definitely watch and, and be aware of. And if you want more information, I, I put a quick link in there, go.illinois.edu slash remoram where the plant clinic has some some wonderful information on this and what you need to know if you if you need to report it or think you may have an instance of it. So to kind of conclude things, you know, what have we learned from these past, um, you know, outbreaks across our continent that have really impacted uh, forests um, here in North America? Well, I think a big lesson is don't move firewood. Any of these pathogens like the ambrosia beetle, the emerald ash borer, they're going to be present in that firewood most likely if it's the species they like. Um, and that's a way that we can just speed up beyond the natural dispersion of those insects to spread. Um, I think another thing we've learned is not to necessarily cut down every tree. And that was a question I got in Southern Illinois as Emerald Ash Borer was approaching. And I was, I was a forester down there for many years before I came to Extension. Um, a lot of forested landowners wanted to cut down every ash tree right away as soon as they read in a single article about uh, Emerald Ash Borer. But uh, what we've learned in the case, I think Dutch elm disease has given us some great examples of resistant elms that still exist. Um, if we cut down every single species, every single tree, ash tree or elm tree, we may unknowingly take away some of that natural resistance there could have been. So that's something to think about on the bigger scale of managing a forested ecosystem. Maybe it's not a great idea to harvest every single ash tree out of there. Um, big lesson out of this is to plant a diversity of species. Um, in the case of um, Dutch elm disease, what we saw was a lot of communities that had nearly, that had a large percent of their urban forest uh, comprised of elms. And so when Dutch elm disease showed up, all of a sudden half the urban forest, you know, overstory is dying of this pathogen, uh, leaving places bare. So um, a lot of folks are in tune with that. Um, municipalities here in Champaign-Urbana are super in tune to this. And, and seek out the most diverse plantings they can get. I think we all need to think about that too, as we add either individual trees to our yard or if you're doing forest restoration, that's just a basic principle. Let's, let's add as much diversity, diversity as we can in case a pathogen comes along and eliminates a species from our either urban or rural forest, uh, we'll, we'll still have something left. Um, international plant material is a common vector of this. Um, you know, all of these, uh, really bad uh, forest pathogens were brought from another continent. So maybe we need to think about how much we're intermixing biota across around the globe. And um, thankfully, uh, we do have very good regulatory regulations in place that track and monitor and limit this kind of spread. So it's not, you know, there's not like there's nothing being done in the US. We actually have a very good system for tracking all this and, and, and keeping track of it. So um, I think the final lesson to kind of learn is that we probably should expect future outbreaks. Um, unfortunately, even with those really strong controls in place and great uh, regulation and tracking of everything, we still have things slipping by every year. And so um, just as homeowners, as uh, foresters or land managers, we need to realize that 
this is something we, that we need to be aware of. We need to be tracking these newer uh, up and coming pathogens and being prepared for those. And, and just simply diversifying in our planting to build resiliency is, is, is you know, probably one of the big lessons to take home. Um, so with that, I will go to some questions if we had a few in the chat box. Um, if you didn't get your question in the chat or you wanna contact me outside of this presentation, here's all my contact information. Um, happy to discuss any of this over email. I think trees are my favorite thing to discuss over email or phone. Reach out and contact me. If you're interested, I write a weekly blog that I post um, at the location there called The Garden Scoop where I cover um, oh just about everything from uh, trees to gardening. I, I do a lot of vegetable gardening, so I probably write about that a lot. Um, pollinator plants are one of my favorites. Just native plants are probably uh, my second favorite to trees and forestry. So um, check it out if you're interested and I'll... Uh, so why don't we go to some questions and here's info for all of our Four Seasons gardening series. Um, they're all accessible as recordings that you can find online and uh, go there and uh, please check it out to see any of our past recordings or future. And then finally, uh, we do have a code, uh, QR code that you can scan um, for a little bit of evaluation or more info. Uh, 